The Bible reading for this morning is Matthew uh, chapter 5, verses 17 to, through 48. Uh, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have, come, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth have passed away, not an iota, not a dot, shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that who, who uh, but I say to you, excuse me, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, fool, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So you are offering your gift at the altar, and they there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gifts. Come to terms quickly with your accuser, while you're going to going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge hands you to the guard, and you be put in prison. Surely I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid every last penny. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If, you, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body goes to hell. It is said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of a, doll, of a divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it said, to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, or by the throne of God, or by earth, or it, or, excuse me, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not take an oath by your head, for you, can, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be a simple yes or no. Anything more than that comes from evil. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. For if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone sues you and takes your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, then go with him two miles. Give the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, and praise for those who persecute you. So you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain to the just and the unjust. 
For if you love those who love you, what reward have, do you have? Do not the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. For those of you who weren't here last week, my name is Myron Heckman. I come from Cape Cod. I was pastor of Cape Cod Bible Lions Church for 41 years, and uh, then had a couple of interim pastorates, and then retired from vocational ministry. You don't retire from ministry. You retire sometimes from vocational ministry. And um, though I have this opportunity again to preach today here in this church. So uh, thank you for your warm welcome. This is a series on the Gospel of Matthew. The title is The King and His Kingdom. Jesus the King inaugurated his kingdom at his first coming. He'll consummate it at his second coming. Right now we are in the continuation of that kingdom. That's your part in the story. Come here and we pray, your kingdom come. Come all the more into my life, into this church, into this city, into this world. So that continuation, you as a church are a, a colony of the kingdom on this hurting, rebellious earth. And you come week by week, you worship, you praise God, you pray to God, and, uh, and you fellowship with each other. And I sense the, you know, the, the sense of the life of the word and the spirit in this congregation because God has made you that outpost of his kingdom that he inaugurated, that he will complete one day, and you are the part of the story where the kingdom continues on. Doesn't mean that our lives don't get messy, they do. Doesn't mean that our, the messes don't come into our church, they do too. But week by week, you stay faithful as a holy congregation to the Lord. Your kingdom come. Now, as a believer, you have a dual citizenship. You have a citizenship on this earth, and then you have one also in heaven. And if they should happen to conflict, the heavenly citizenship takes priority because that's your eternal identity. Now, it helps to know the law of any kingdom you're in. For example, you go to another country and you rent a car, you better find out which side of the road to drive on. And if you were to go to Dubai, that uh, tourist destination on the Arabian Peninsula, uh, there are some unique laws there that they have to help preserve the cleanliness of the city and sightliness of it. And so they have a law there that says uh, you can't have a dirty car. Eating, drinking, and chewing gum, you can't do that on the public transport. And hanging clothes from a balcony, no. Storing your junk on the balcony? No. Having a satellite dish there? Don't do that there. Posting ads and flyers is against the law. And finally, to drip water from an air conditioner onto a public place is against the law. I think we'd all like to see that one be a law. Have you ever been dripped on by that? Yeah. You want to know the laws of any domain you are in, and so that includes the kingdom of God. The psalmist said, I delight in your law. Yeah, his kingdom has law. And today we look at the law of the kingdom that Jesus brought, and we want this, this text today to help you to delight in his law all the more. Jesus was accused of undermining the law. The law is given to us in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, and it's summarized in the Ten Commandments there. And then there are other laws from Exodus to, to Deuteronomy that expand upon those Ten Commandments. 
the scribes and the Pharisees followed the law, and for a very good reason, they believed that if they would follow God's covenant law faithfully as a nation, then God would bless them and free them from the oppression of the despised Roman occupiers, changing how they live and taxing them and so forth. Oh, we're rid of them, and so let's all follow the law. And some in Jesus' days thought he was undermining the law and thus undermining the nation, putting the nation in danger. So by the law, the Sabbath is a day of rest. The Pharisees saw Jesus healing on the Sabbath. Jesus, this is a day of rest. It's not a day to do this work of healing. They also saw that Jesus on the Sabbath, his disciples were walking by a wheat field, and as they walked, they gleaned some of the wheat berries there in their hand. That was, that was lawful to do that. And then they chew on those berries. And uh, again, the Pharisees looked and said, what are you doing here, Jesus, allowing your, your disciples to do that? That's working on the Sabbath. We need to keep the Sabbath that our nation might flourish. So they said he wants to destroy the law. It's God's law. You can't do that without putting our nation in danger. But Jesus answers that charge in today's text. Very clearly he answers it. And it helps us to know what is our relationship to the law. So in verse 17, the very first verse we read this morning, Jesus firmly upheld the law. Verse 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He makes it clear there. He didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. In other words, he came to bring the law to its intended purpose. So here Jesus strongly affirms the law. Then Jesus doubles down on affirming the law. Verse 18, For truly I say to you, unless heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a doubt, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So now he's upholding the law to the smallest detail, the dot on the I, the cross of the T. For Jesus, the law is all good. Jesus triples down on upholding the law. Verse 19. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That's the way to downgrade your Christian life. Now, he goes on to say that whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He is not abolishing the law. And then Jesus quadruples down on the high stature of the law. Verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes taught the law. The Pharisees obeyed it. The Pharisees, in fact, had numbered the laws in the Old Testament very carefully. They came up with 613 laws in the Old Testament to obey, and then they had other rules, corollary laws, to go along with that to make sure they didn't break the, those commandments. For example, how many steps you could take on the Sabbath. That's not in the Bible how many steps, but they took that just to say, we don't want to break the Sabbath day. Now, they had a zeal for the law. And your righteousness, Jesus says, must exceed that to enter the kingdom of heaven. So I'm sure you have written down the 613 laws and kept them in a notebook and reviewed them periodically to make sure you're following them. I'm sure of that. You haven't? Well, neither have I. But look at this righteousness that are called to Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus raises the bar on that pole vault. And we have a problem. All right, let's see what Jesus has to say to this problem we have. What Jesus has to say is he raises the bar even higher. All right, the world record set this week at the Olympics the high bar of the pole vault was uh, 20 feet 6 inches approximately 
And, uh, you know, how would you do if you were trying to achieve that? Yeah, we'd have different varieties here. Someone would get the, would get the pole in the hole. Someone wouldn't be able to get up on that pole. Most of us wouldn't be able to. If we did, we'd go maybe six feet in the air or something like that, hold on and swing across to the, the uh, foam padding there, that kind of thing. What are we going to do? That bar is high. And now Jesus raises the bar even higher to apply it not just to our outward lives, but to our inward lives. So verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and your murders will be liable to judgment. Well, at least I haven't murdered anyone. But Jesus says, verse 22, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, eternal contempt there, will be liable to the hell of fire. It's time to pull our collars a little bit, get warm in here. Go down to verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. At least I haven't committed adultery. Now look at Jesus here, verse 23. Verse 28, rather. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Oh, Jesus raised that bar. And he does that throughout that text. All these rigorous standards as you go on through the text and see that what we're called to do and how high that bar is and how far we, we fall short of that. So it's more applications of the law. And then it's all capped off by the last verse read there, verse 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's the world record on steroids. And it makes perfect sense because we have a perfect God who demands of us a perfectly righteous life. Oh, the problem is compounded. What will we do, we who have no grounds to get into heaven? Have you a zeal for righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees? Are you as inwardly pure as you project outwardly? Have you achieved perfection? I ask the same question to myself and allow me to answer the questions. It's no, no, and no. Before the law, we're doomed. What do we do? It helps when looking at a text of the scriptures to keep looking at it and to look and see what does God have for us of good news in this text. And the good news in this text emerges as you look at it right in that first verse 17 and there are four words that speak to us so wonderfully. Verse 17, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. You and I are saved because of those four words that Jesus says right there, that Jesus fulfilled the law. And the law, Jesus fulfilled in different ways. One is he fulfilled the sacrificial system, the ceremonial law. He fulfilled those wonderfully because we have all those sacrifices and those rituals in the Old Testament commanded to do in the law and Jesus fulfilled them. You have perhaps read through Leviticus, one of the toughest books in the Bible to get all the way through, and you read there ceremony, sacrifice, peace offering, substitute sacrifices throughout that book, and my, you're exhausted spiritually to read them all. Jesus didn't come to abolish that law. He came to fulfill it, to bring it to its intended 
end. He did that on the cross, fulfilled all their sacrifices and peace offerings once for all time. I will thank the Lord for that. It's good news. Jesus obeyed the moral law perfectly. He did not fail in one command of God. Can you name a commandment that Jesus did not keep? Can you think of a time that Jesus did not love his heavenly Father perfectly and love his fellow humans perfectly? Can you think of a time when Jesus did not speak the truth? Allow me to answer. No, no, and no. That Jesus, that's our King who came to live the law perfectly and then his righteousness is put on us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he, the Father, made Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is the gracious exchange made possible because Jesus fulfilled the law. All the righteousness he did, keeping the law perfectly. You must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's Jesus Christ. And in faith, by grace through faith, you are clothed in his righteousness. You can only stand before the throne clothed in that robe of Jesus' righteousness, and he's provided it. What good news this is that he fulfilled the law and clothes you in it. Jesus, that's your king. So what's our relationship then to the law today? Well, first we are free from the law in two respects. First respect is we are free from the law's condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Or oh, stand on that one. John talks about how if our hearts condemn us, and sometimes they can, can't they? And yet he says, God's is greater than, that, than our hearts. Yes, know the subjective truth of what Jesus Christ has done for you in fulfilling the law. So we're free from the law's condemnation. We're also free from attempting to gain our salvation by our works. The Apostle Paul wrote, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified because we just can't keep it. Jesus Christ has kept that law perfectly. When we try to do it, we're going to flounder in it. It's our instinct to do it. But know that instead of you having to earn it, that's our instinct. It should be earned. Well, Jesus earned it. He fulfilled it. He did it for you. Some people spell faith as D-O, what they do for God. The Bible spells faith as D-O-N-E. What God has done for you in Jesus Christ. You're free from trying to impress God with what you do. Say, well, I'm, I, I'm better than the other person. God doesn't grade on the curve. Um, I'm, I'm at least 51% good. 20 feet, 6 inches. Does 51% make it there? It does not. Jesus Christ has kept it perfectly. Rest in that. As our song said, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what you are. Now the law does have three legitimate uses in our lives. We're free from its condemnation, free from trying to use it to achieve our salvation, but there's three classic uses of the law. This is historic theology. The first use is civil use as a restraint on evil. The speed limit on the streets of New York are 25 miles per hour. I saw it on a sign coming off a highway there. 25 miles per hour. Now, 
sometimes you just can't drive more than 25 hour, miles an hour. It's not even a temptation in many streets here, isn't it? But other times they might be empty and people will drive 35 miles per hour, 40 miles per hour, but yet that law of the speed limit there acts as a restraint because if there was no speed limit known, what would it be out there on the roads? It'd be crazy. That's a restraint on evil. So we believe in civil authority being a God-given authority to be a restraint on evil. We believe in the principle of law. We need laws against theft and murder and fraud and bribery and all those kinds of things to act as a restraint on evil. That's a gift from God. The second use of the law is to show us that we are sinners in need of a savior. The law condemns us. When you were reading this morning, Matthew chapter five, and reading all that rigorous standards that Jesus was teaching, did your heart sink a little bit there and say it's too much? And I can't hold, I can't do this perfectly? Yeah, because the law is meant to show you that you are a lost sinner in need of a savior. It is a tutor, the apostle Paul said. The law is a tutor to bring us to Jesus Christ because it shows us our need. The third use of the law, first is restraint on evil. Second is to be a tutor to bring us to Christ. The third use of the law is to instruct us in love. How did Jesus summarize the law? He was asked, which is the most important commandment of all? His answer was, the first commandment of all is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Love God wholeheartedly. Love people thoughtfully as you want to be done for yourself. Love them unselfishly. Love God wholeheartedly. Love people unselfishly. It simplifies it, doesn't it? That's how God summarized the law. That's the heart of the law. All the law is instructing us on how to love those ways, to love God and love our neighbor. Now the Pharisees were dedicated to keeping the law, but they missed its core of love. They're so focused on their own righteousness and how they could show that and, and, and highlighting other people's faults and hiding their own faults that they missed what the law was about. And that's what Jesus came to say. He wasn't disagreeing with the law. He was disagreeing with the Pharisees' interpretation of the law. And so he taught us to love. The commandments of God instruct us in love. For a summer in college, I was on a, uh, in a working in a summer ministry, youth, and the town we were in had a festival, and our ministry had a tent there where there was music and a place to talk with people and so forth, and I went around the, the uh, fair there to uh, see what else was there. A church had a booth with a Bible quiz on it, and I went by it and said, I don't know, I'll take it later, I guess, and I I did notice there was a very attractive young lady at the booth there, and I thought, well, she must be serving the Lord, uh, a very active Christian, and, uh, you know, I could see her asking her out, maybe we could date her, and uh, uh, maybe somebody would get engaged and get married, you know, let's go a different direction than my other relationships had gone, you know. And, and so then I, I came back around the next day, and I, I took the Bible quiz. It was 10 questions, uh, 10 true and false questions. And if you press the right button, you got a, a very satisfying, rewarding ding. And if you press the wrong button, you got a very rude buzz. And so I'll, so I'll take this. Uh, I'm uh, majoring in Bible in college here, so I think I'll do okay. We'll see, though. And so you go, question number one, Adam and Eve were the first human parents of us all. Okay, that's a T, true, ding. Uh, Jesus was raised in Bethlehem. Uh, okay, that's false, ding. 
uh, Jesus was raised in Nazareth, by the way, born in Bethlehem, but raised in Nazareth. Okay, another question comes up, and it's, uh, Moses took two of each animal upon the ark. Oh, oh, tried to trick us there. That's false. Ding. It was Noah on the ark. All right, I hope you caught that. Uh, otherwise, you get that rude buzz. Okay, to question number nine. Question number nine said, the Ten Commandments do not apply to believers today. Oh, yeah, I think murder still applies to us. Yeah, so uh, I pressed the T, and I got a buzz. Whoa. Shocking. Well, I finished off the quiz, and then I, I went to the young lady behind the booth there and, and said, I, I got a question about number nine there. I'm surprised that it, 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 it said the ten, ten Commandments don't apply to believers today. I want, is the machine working right? And she said, would you like to sign up for a Bible study? And I thought, no, I don't think I do. Uh, go, it's not going to be worth it just to even date you because uh, it's just a different theology you have. And so I had to break up with her in my mind right then and there. Well, the church had a different theology, and the, the, the quiz reflected the theology put in that question that says the, the Old Testament, in a sense, has passed away. It's all about the New Testament. And so in that they're, they're taking a different look at that, but we'd say, no, the New Testament does tie in the Old Testament commandments to our Christian life. For example, James, in his letter, wrote of what he called the royal law. This is James 2.8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, the royal law, law of the kingdom, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, there's the royal law. You do well. Love your neighbor as yourself and Old Testament law. And then the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 13, 9 and 10. The commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not cover, covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. From the commandments of God, we learn how to love. The Ten Commandments teach us how to love God and teach us how to love one another. Without it, that, that instruction in love, we will be left to our feelings and our instincts and our intuitions, our own hearts, which can be so deceitful. Here's an example. One growing trend today is what's called open marriage. It's where a couple is married, but they determine that it's not going to be about forsaking all others. Rather, they'll be married, but they are free, each of them, if they choose, to find other intimate romantic relationships. And uh, they, you know, they say, I don't want to be sneaking around and hiding this and lying to you. I want this to be out in the open. And so it, it's presented as being a, a healthy uh, arrangement. I uh, read about these stories in the, the New York Times, and, and they'll, they'll do a story on that very detached and kind of like, this could be a growing trend here. It might be helpful to some people. That sort of thing is kind of the, the tone of the article. Um, but the, 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 the relationships in the stories always end up with jealousy. They don't last. Now, they are saying, I'm trying to live in love here, but we are instructed in love very simply on the commandment that says you shall not commit adultery. It may be possible, as they claim, to love more than one person at a time romantically, but it is not possible to love them well. You can only love one person well in that sense, and if that's the case, if, if it's not ethical, um, then it is not truly love. So in the voices that come in our world, God continues to instruct us in what instruct us in what love is. It's a great use of the law. Going a different direction. The Old Testament law has a building code in it. It's found in, in Deuteronomy 22. Here's what, what the Lord says. When you build a new house, 
you must build a railing around the edge of its flat roof that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. It's a safety matter. A flat roof could be used for a living. Some has stairs that go up there. People might be up there for a different reason, but some just to, to, to be out there in the cool of the evening. And what happens if you've got a high wall, nothing to guard there? Someone is bound to fall off it. Now, what command is that instructing us about? You shall not murder. Because the, the you shall not murder also says to us then you do the opposite that you seek to preserve life. You seek to enhance life. That's love. In another case, it says, um, this is Exodus 21. If anyone uncovers a pit or digs a hole, uh, digs one and fails to cover it and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the one who opened the pit must pay the owner for the loss and take the dead animal in exchange. So it's saying don't, don't leave dangerous things in place there because in this case an animal could wander into your property and fall into it and now what have you done there? What's the command that this is expanding upon? You shall not steal. So you have to make up for it by buying that dead animal. Taking that in a little different direction, I was on a group mission to Mexico, there were maybe 15 of us on that trip. Went down to a compound there, down there, and, and the first day the, the water pump uh, wasn't working. And so the uh, guys working on it took off a two by four sheet of plywood or whatever it was, and, and uh, maybe a metal uh, a platform there, and took that off, set that aside, and they got down and were looking, working on that. And, and then they needed a part, and so they left, and they left that uncovered. And I was looking at that, having read this text some, some time before this, and I thought, ooh, that's not looking safe there. It's right in the courtyard there, and the mission director's wife is legally blind, all right? So I'm going, oh, I can't take this anymore. And I went to the, the, uh, the uh, chapel there, unauthorized by anybody else to buy this word, and pulled out four folding chairs, metal folding chairs, put them in the corners of that hole. I just said, it's got to serve as a warning. And I'll tell you what, it just released that tension to me because we want to enhance life, preserve life, is what we want to do. Now, you might say, well, people should be more careful. Well, people aren't always careful. People make mistakes. Well, you don't want to leave a roller skate on the top uh, staircase, do you? At the top of the staircase. Um, and if you think, yeah, people should be more careful, I want to ask you this question. Have you ever, in your stocking feet, stepped on a Lego? All right? You should have been more careful, right? What happens? People can't foresee everything. Uh, people make mistakes. Someone leaves the Lego in that, that traffic pattern there, or you go through a dark room where you're distracted by something. You understand human uh, vulnerabilities in order to love your neighbor. So this is the law that God puts within your heart. To love God wholeheartedly, to love your neighbor unselfishly. Jeremiah 31 talks about this being put into our hearts. 31, 33 of Jeremiah. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. He's talking here about the new covenant, which Jesus at the Last Supper took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus brought that new covenant with his bringing the kingdom and it goes on here in Jeremiah 31 to say, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Oh, God writes it in your heart. It means he's putting new desires there. Have you found God putting new desires in your heart? Have your desires for God's righteousness, his ways, God himself grown over the years is because he wrote it on your heart by placing his Holy Spirit there. When, you, when God writes his law in your heart, it means you move from 
oh, I have to, to, I want to. Oh, it's what I want. He captures your heart. The light, then, in the law. Fanny Crosby, who uh, grew up in Brooklyn, a prolific hymn writer, she went to uh, was a Sixth Avenue Bible Baptist Church in Brooklyn for uh, many years in her life. And she wrote the, the hymn, Redeemed. That third verse says, I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight. Yeah. There was she was, seeing the, the king. And the law of love he has is one in which we delight best of all the laws we have so three questions do you delight in this king do you delight in him having freed you from the condemnation of the law do you delight in his royal law of love may your answers be yes yes and yes I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight. Let's take a moment here just for a silent prayer. Time here to see how God might apply this to your life or, or to seal it in your hearts. Um, take this time here before the Lord in quietness.